Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for visiting my YouTube channel. I am Dietmar Kugler, a German historian focused on American frontier history, a topic which I've been dealing with for over 50 years. I'm the author of over 60 books and many articles and essays on the westward expansion in North America. Today I'm going to speak about a fairly unknown episode of the North American travel of the famous Maximilian Prince of Wheat. One of the most important European travelers to the American West in the early 19th century was a German nobleman, Maximilian Prince of Wheat. He recorded his impressions at a time when America was rapidly changing from an agrarian to industrial nation. His accounts of the Indian nations along the upper Missouri and of the Great Plains formed a striking first image of the new world for Europeans at the time and are still recognized for their accuracy by anthropologists and historians today. Perhaps even more significant are the paintings and sketches by his traveling companion, the Swiss artist Karl Bodmer, who in painstakingly photographic-like detail documented notable Indian leaders as well as tribal life which would soon disappear. I will show you some samples of the wonderful paintings by Bodmer. That Maximilian of Wied, in preparation for his journey to the Far West, stayed for a while in Pittsburgh and its surroundings, is an almost forgotten episode. However, his own descriptions of this part of his trip provide vivid images of Western Pennsylvania in the early 1830s. Maximilian was born in 1782 as the eighth of 11 children of Louise Wilhelmine, Countess of Sein Wittgenstein Berleburg, and Friedrich Karl, Count of Wied Neuwied, ruler of one of Germany's many small principalities at that time. From 1802 till 1806 and from 1813 to 1814, Maximilian served in the Prussian army, rising to the rank of a major of the 3rd Brandenburg Hussar Regiment. He fought in the battles of Jena and Auerstedt and was awarded the Iron Cross. Between 1808 and 1813, and after his retirement from military service, he devoted himself to studies of natural science, geographical and ethnological subjects as a so-called Privatgelehrter, a private scholar common for noblemen in those days who were not involved in governmental tasks. As the eighth child with several elder brothers, Maximilian had no prospect of heading the family estate. In fact, he spent his entire appanage on scientific literature, research, explorations, expeditions, and publication of his studies. From 1815 to 1817, his first explorative venture led him to South America. Two years later, he began planning his North American expedition, which took place between 1832 and 1834 and bestowed international recognition on him. With reference to Maximilian's military service, I have to add that on November 1, 1840, the Prussian king, Friedrich Wilhelm IV, appointed Maximilian major general. Together with his servant, the Leibjäger David Dreidoppel, a skillful hunter and expert taxidermist, and the artist Karl Bodmer, Maximilian boarded an American steamship in May 1832 near Rotterdam, Holland, and landed on the 4th of July in Boston. From here, the group proceeded to New York and Philadelphia, and then deeper into the country by carriage. I have to explain a bit more about the term Leibjäger. That described a special servant at court who was akin to an official hunter 
and accompanied, assisted, and reported to his master, the prince. He had to look after the equipment, care for the guns and the ammunition, save the kill, skin the game, and if necessary, preserve mead and hives. In his master's own forest, he acted as gamekeeper. In the case of Maximilian of Wied, Drydoppel also served as personal butler on his journeys. Despite his enterprising and adventurous spirit, Maximilian was physically a frail man of fragile health, just about five foot four in height. He suffered from old injuries received in the battles of in the Battle of Chateau Thierry and from malaria, which he had caught in Brazil. According to some eyewitnesses, he had lost his front teeth, and so was difficult to understand. Moreover, he spoke English with a very strong Prussian accent. Several times during the North American journey, his health almost collapsed, but he demonstrated an astounding stamina, iron will, and firm determination, especially during the hard winter at Fort Clark, Dakota Territory. Originally, he had planned an immediate departure to the West on his arrival in Boston. His intention was to head to St. Louis and take uh, the first steamer to the upper Missouri. However, while traveling from Philadelphia westwards, he was smitten with cholera, which had spread over the American East at that time. Maximilian described it himself. This disease reached a highly dangerous degree in New York and Philadelphia. It seemed to be impossible to avoid it, so I chose the way down the Ohio and set out for Pittsburgh. He stopped in Bethlehem, Reading, and Harrisburg, where he received some scanty medical treatment, arriving in Pittsburgh on September 22nd at midnight. Here, he was welcomed and hosted by several citizens of German origin. Two were Charles Walls and Charles von Bonhorst. According to the Pittsburgh City Directory, Walls was a wholesaler of English and German goods located on the east side of Wood Street between Second and Front Streets. Von Bonhorst was a nobleman and former Prussian officer who was an active contributor to the cultural life of the city. Both men had close business relations with the Harmonist Society in economy. Despite his poor health, Maximilian toured Pittsburgh and left a description that showed a significant, aspiring industrial city. I'm quoting him. Pittsburgh is a fairly old, widespread, but not very attractive town. It is famous for its factories and its flourishing trade. The city as such has about 12,000 inhabitants, but together with the suburbs, one reckons with an entire population of about 24,000. Among them are many Germans, and among those some well-off merchants. Coal mines nearby, some of them burning at present, furnish the many steam machines, furnaces and chimneys with plenty of fuel, and the whole city is covered in gray smoke. This smoke gives the buildings a dark appearance. The architecture of this town is not uniform. Nice brick buildings stand in between older wooden structures. Some streets of newer development are handsome. The new houses are splendid and elegant. The streets, however, are badly paved, dirty and in insufficiently lighted. There are many ironworks rolling mills, glass factories, and cotton mills, mostly powered by steam engines, which too are constructed here. The city is situated on a point between the rivers Monongahela and Allegheny, which on their confluence form the Ohio. The Allegheny is spanned by an approximately 1300 foot long bridge, which has covered sidewalks on each side. A covered water pipe of the same length crosses the river as well. A similar, very long and colossal bridge is constructed across the Monongahela. Maximilian met with the celebrated Pittsburgh artist James Reed Lambton. 
a prominent portrait painter who had just opened a gallery and museum, and he decided to visit the settlement of Economy, founded in 1824 by the Harmonist sect from southwest Germany. He went there on September 29th. I quote Maximilian, the friendly settlement with wide chessboard lay like laid out but unpaved streets with fine singly built houses and a remarkable church offers a scene of good order and well-being. A wide road leads into the village where we looked up quarters <coughs> where we took up quarters in an excellent boarding house which is administered by the community. All the inhabitants are German. The Harmonists represented one of the few 19th century religious socialistic experiments in the United States that experienced economic success. They launched high quality and profitable industries and their highly esteemed handcrafted and industrial products made them one of the wealthiest ecclesiastical communities in America. There were about 100 utopian communist, religious and non-religious settlements in the United States in the first half of the 19th century. Most of them failed. The harmonists were not only successful, but one of the longest living of these community experiments. They inspired some prominent philosophers and intellectuals of their time, like the British social reformer Robert Owen, the German poet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, and the German economist Friedrich List, with regard to an idealistic social order and form of government. Maximilian wrote, the order established in economy is exemplary. During the day, nobody is on the streets, as all inhabitants are usefully occupied. Young men and women are working as well as the children in different factories. They don't get any wages, but plenty of everything they need. All of them are wearing their clean and tidy Swabian costume. And the only language one can hear is German. The entire estate and uh, the turnover is common property. Every inhabitant had given his personal means into a mutual fund. Mr. Rep, the founder, and his adopted son are the directors. But there are some complaints about a lack of regular account rendering and the somewhat dictatorial administration. Nevertheless, it is obvious that the founding and management of this artificial community is exemplary and meritorious for the founder, George Rapp. Rapp established several plants with steam machines. Moreover, they are manufacturing silk from their own sericulture. They produce all their needs themselves. There is significant agriculture, wine growing, and cattle breeding. As their members were obliged to live in celibacy and access to the society was restricted by George Rapp, to see, you see his picture here, the harmonists died out at the beginning of the 20th century. On Maximilian's visit to economy, the society had not yet reached its economic peak. The village counted about 150 buildings. In their wisely managed prosperous plants, they always adopted the newest technologies, as Maximilian mentioned. Their factories already made an annual profit of over $20,000, an impressive sum in those days. With surprise, the prince noticed the strong educational mission of the harmonists. In 1827, the society not only installed one of the first natural history museums in the United States, but also boasted one of the best scientific libraries in the country. Here, Maximilian had the opportunity to study the most recent scholarly publications on North American flora, fauna, and geography. He obtained his final preparations for his Western venture among the harmonists. Some of his impressions on his visit to economy read as follows. It is known that the old rep with his society of 600 to 700 Swabian immigrants 
came with very little means to America. With his followers, he founded three settlements. First, Old Harmony near the Ohio, then New Harmony at the Wabash in Indiana, and now Economy near Pittsburgh. After we had seen all the points of interest, we went to the director's house and received a friendly welcome from his family, entirely dressed in the style of rural Württemberg, the German province from where from whence the harmonists came. Very soon, the founder, Mr. Rapp, appeared. An elderly, stout and venerable looking man with gray and white hair and a long beard. We had supper with him. Drank a very good, a very good self-produced wine and enjoyed finally the singing and piano recital of six or seven young girls and a young man who works as a teacher here. Not only had the setting of Pittsburgh and surroundings attracted Maximilian's attention, but also as a dedicated naturalist, he immediately developed a scholarly interest in plants and animals of the area. He wrote, the region of Pittsburgh boasts some zoological curiosities. On several islands on the Ohio, he examined and measured the different trees and expressed his surprise at their height. In his notes, he mentions river mussels and big soft shell turtles, which are often offered on the local markets. And furthermore, a noteworthy animal, which was locally called Allegheny alligator. Maximilian had several of them caught and sketched by Carl Bodmer. The so-called Allegheny alligator was a hellbender, one of only three giant salamanders found in the world. In Maximilian's time, it was still common throughout the Mideastern United States, since it has disappeared from many streams because of declining water quality. Hellbenders are 16 to 17 inches long on average although single specimens have reached a length of up to 29 inches. The prince left Pittsburgh on October 8, 1832. As the Ohio was too shallow for steamships at that time of the year, he had to travel overland till Wheeling. He said, we crossed the Ohio with a ferry boat, which paddle wheels were driven by four horses. On the other side of the river, he entered a stagecoach. From Wheeling, he steamed up the Ohio to New Harmony, Indiana, where his weak health caused by the cholera forced him to stay for the entire winter. Carl Bodmer used the time to make some independent trips to different parts of the American East and South and to sketch and paint animals from the southern states as well as from the Allegheny and Ohio areas. His works later illustrated a scholarly publication by Maximilian on North American reptiles and amphibians. This book appeared 1865 in Dresden. It is a volume which is not only extremely rare, but also similarly unknown to the general public as is a visit of this famous European traveler and explorer to Pittsburgh and economy. I have to thank Dr. Andrew Masick, a very good friend for over two decades, president and CEO of the Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania and the director of the John Hines History Center in Pittsburgh, who made possible my first visit to old economy. Moreover, he suggested that I should write this text as an essay for Western Pennsylvania History magazine in 2002. The quotations by Maximilian I mentioned in my text are originally in German. They have been translated into English by me. Thank you for listening. I hope to see you again.